Back in the heyday of the analog era, while magnetic tape was the medium for recording, the distribution of music and other audio material was primarily on vinyl disc. Mastering was mainly concerned with getting the completed mix on tape onto the somewhat more restricted medium of vinyl records. Tape generally has a wider dynamic range than vinyl, and mechanical issues in vinyl playback have to be anticipated to avoid tracking and skipping problems. The process of cutting a vinyl master is prone to failure for even a single glitch, an expensive exercise, making it critical to ensure that the audio signal is properly prepared for those challenges. Even today, the resurgence in vinyl distribution, though it is a niche market and overall music distribution, has brought those concerns back, at least for those who opt for a vinyl release. Back in the day, mastering was always handled by a dedicated mastering engineer with a collection of hardware specifically geared to that process. Incidentally, this is still true today for many commercial releases, even though software tools are now available to and used by the masses. For vinyl mastering, the audio on tape was often compressed to help it fit into the slightly more restrictive dynamic range of the vinyl medium. At the time, the compression was not intended to necessarily punch up the audio, as it often is nowadays, but to simply control the dynamics, ideally without any noticeable effect. Back then, dynamic processing at the mastering stage was also needed to prepare the audio for the unique considerations of creating a master disc for vinyl duplication. The waveform on tape is cut into the single groove of a metal master disc, which is then used to replicate the actual vinyl discs distributed to the public. The stylus cuts the shape of the wave into the groove in real time, and since even a single jump or over-excursion will turn the master into a doorstop, the compression and limiting must be carefully set to prevent this. Low-frequency information in the audio wave, especially on one side of a stereo wave, is more likely to cause problems, so EQ may be applied to anticipate any potential issues, and often the lows are reduced to mono and pan to the center to help tracking in both cutting and later vinyl playback. A special standardized EQ curve, the RIAA curve, is applied during cutting, which will be precisely reversed in playback on all systems to restore flat response. When digital distribution took over, first CDs and eventually digital downloads and streaming, different concerns took over, and the mastering process changed accordingly. Instead of being a simply technical exercise, mastering gradually became more of a creative process. The same types of processing were employed, but now they were often used to subtly improve on the finished mix, to add presence and punch, as well as for the more traditional tasks of checking for and eliminating potential technical problems. The main tools used in modern mastering are EQ, compression, and limiting. Since they're being used on the full mix, affecting all elements of the mix, these processes are normally applied much more subtly than they would be at the mixing stage, where they'd be used on individual elements in a production. EQ is typically used to add presence and clarity, so if a mastered track is heard in less-than-ideal playback environments, the listener will still enjoy good clarity and intelligibility. Compression is applied not only to control overall dynamics of a mix, but to give the audio a little extra push. Again, this can help low-level passages come through more clearly in noisy listening environments, but the compression is also commonly used to make the mix more aggressive and more likely to draw in and envelop the listener. For many years now, a big part of mastering has been to use brick wall limiting, a purely digital process, as the final mastering stage to push the average level of recordings to be as loud as possible, theoretically to help them stand out in radio play or streaming, again, drawing the listener in more effectively. This practice has been dubbed the loudness war, and many people feel it went too far. In fact, the current trend is to shoot for slightly lower, more reasonable average levels, especially for product intended for streaming. But loudness maximizing, as it's called, is still practiced when mastering for some media, like CDs, which are still widely distributed, and the modern mastering engineer may end up making different versions of the final product to suit different distribution formats. These three main tools are usually applied sequentially, with the brick wall limiter as the last plugin. However, they may or may not be chained in the same order as they would be on a track in a mix. Many mixers prefer to place compression ahead of EQ, so dialing up large tonal changes doesn't necessitate resetting the compression threshold. Of course, that's not a hard and fast rule, just a common approach. In mastering, often the EQ is placed ahead of the compression, since mastering applications usually call for much more subtle application of all processes, small EQ tweaks of a dB or two are unlikely to require changes to a compressor that follows. 
but again, not a hard and fast rule. Sometimes a multiband compressor is used, as opposed to a regular single band compressor, and subtle tonal rebalancing may be achieved by different settings in the different bands, negating the need for a dedicated EQ. It all depends on the particular track and the judgment of the mastering engineer. Sometimes other processing may also be used in mastering, like exciters to help a band limited track, or even reverb or ambience to add a little subtle depth to an overly dry mix. Most of the time this won't be necessary, and the main three processes will be all that's needed, but on occasion a little more work may need to be done, and so these tools can also be considered part of a mastering engineer's toolbox. Before any mastering session is concluded, the mastering engineer will want to do a final check for potential problems, like phase issues or image and frequency imbalances, with any technical issues addressed before the final master is bounced and released. So that's a fairly simple overview of both the evolution of mastering and the basics of the process in modern mastering sessions. Towards the end of the course, we'll look at a typical approach for setting up and processing one or more tracks on a mastering session. But first I want to go through the various tools for addressing mastering needs.